Hello everybody, I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. You can find us online at cruxnow.com. And I am the host of this show, Last Week in the Church. This is the show where we take kind of leftover news, we yank it out of the fridge, put it in the skillet, sprinkle some, some spices in our special Crux brand secret sauce and serving up piping hot. Here's what we've got for you this week. The Pope ups the ante on Ukraine, announcing that this coming Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, he will consecrate Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in keeping with the request of Our Lady at Fatima. We're going to break that down for you on multiple levels, including the geopolitical, the ecumenical, the Mariological, and finally, for what it reveals about Francis himself. Next, shaking it up, the Pope's long-awaited overhaul of the Roman Curia, the central governing bureaucracy of the Vatican, is finally at hand. We're going to go through it and separate the wheat from the chaff for you. Finally, the Cardinal gets his day in court. Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, the Pope's former chief of staff, delivers his opening statement and his testimony at the Vatican's trial of the century for financial crime. We will sum all that up for you. And then we are going to end with a, the big reveal, the announcement of last week in the church's Bishop of the Week. Totally new category. Not sure I'll ever use it again, but dagnabbit, we've got one this week. That's what we've got for you. So please stick around. <laughs> Well, hello there, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Hope you had a great weekend. We have got a lot of Vatican news to go through for you this week, but we begin on a slightly different front. From the outside, you might think that the big dividing line in Rome is between, oh, I don't know, liberals and conservatives, fans of Pope Francis and his critics or maybe between church and state, between practicing Catholics and anti-clericalists, even maybe between North and South. There is a big North-South divide here in Italy. It's not unlike the United States, and Rome is smack dab in the middle. Here's the thing. All of those things are theater. They're, they're minor. They fade into insignificance compared to the real dividing line in this town, the one that divides families, the one that causes friendships to rise and fall, the one that will send people into the street spontaneously with either rage or joy. And that is the dividing line between Roma and Lazio. Those are the two professional soccer teams here in town. Now, you could think maybe, you know, for an American analogy, Yankees, Mets, Cubs, White Sox, but not so. Because in America, our sporting passions are divided across at least eight things. We, we got professional football, baseball, basketball, and hockey, and we got the college versions of all of those things. In Italy, for all intents and purposes, there is only calcio, cal soccer. Soccer is the civic religion here, and nowhere is a crosstown rivalry more intense than here in the capital city. Now, so when these two teams encounter one another, and what's known as the Derby happens twice a year, it's a big deal. The city comes screeching to a halt. And Sunday night, there was the Derby. Roma and Lazio played here in the Olympic Stadium. Now, when I got here to Rome more than 20 years ago, I spontaneously became a Romanista, fan of Roma. When my wife got here, almost a decade ago. She did the same thing. So our family is Romanista. Sunday night, we had a friend over who was also Romanista. And look, I know there's a pandemic on. I know that there is a war raging in Ukraine. I know that there are worries about the economy. I know that there are a lot of dark clouds on the horizon. But for 90 glorious minutes, we had a foretaste of paradise in the greatest first half in the history of the Derby, Rome put up not one, not two, but three goals, the last two of which were absolute masterpieces and then cruised to a 3 nothing victory. Ladies and gentlemen, it was transcendent. It was spectacular. It is glorious. So today I say to one and all, Forza Roma. All right. 
We begin news-wise this week with the surprise announcement that Pope Francis intends to consecrate Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary this Friday in keeping with the request of the Virgin at Fatima. He will do so here in Rome. His closest deputy and, and friend in the Vatican, Polish Cardinal Konrad Krajewski, will be in Fatima to perform the same act. And the Pope has asked all the bishops of the world to join him, again, in keeping with the request of Mary at Fatima. Now, in terms of global news coverage, this didn't light up the scoreboard. You know, it's not the same thing as Biden transferring shoulder-launched anti-tank missiles to Ukraine or Zelensky demanding that Putin talk to him. I, I get that. But in church terms, this is sort of an earthquake. Up to this point, the drumbeat of criticism against Francis has been that he has been too reticent, too diplomatic, too even-handed, hasn't denounced Russia or Putin by name, and on and on. In, in, again, in, in Catholic and spiritual terms, this is the most dramatic statement the Pope has made because let us remember that Fatima was the premier devotion of anti-Russian hawks during the Cold War. Remember that Mary, in 1917, announced to the seers at Fatima that one day she would ask for the consecration of Russia. She delivered that request in 1929 and specified that if it didn't happen, then there would be wars and persecutions, Russia would spread its errors throughout the world, you know, mass hysteria. And we all know what has happened subsequently leading up to the present day. So for the Pope to identify himself with that devotion at this moment in time is dramatic. That's the geopolitical level. It will be seen by the Russians and has been seen as the clearest anti-Russian statement regarding this war that Pope Francis has made so far. As far as the ecumenical dimension of this, believe me, the Russian Orthodox have not missed the significance of this either. We have already seen an increasing big chill in ties between the Vatican and the Patriarchate of Moscow, this mostly, because Patriarch Kirill, who tried a little bit to be even-handed at the beginning, has become increasingly shrill in his pro-Kremlin, pro-Putin statements. This, as the war has raged on and become increasingly brutal, the Pope's top diplomat, Italian Cardinal Pietro Perlin, the Vatican Secretary of State, has become increasingly sharp in his condemnation of Russia and Russian atrocities in Ukraine. And now this. The likely consequence is that it is going to set back ecumenical relations between Rome and Moscow for some time to come, although that comes with a big if. And the big if is, does Putin survive this crisis? If he doesn't, if somebody else takes over in Moscow with perhaps a different attitude, then ecumenical relations will be recalibrated too because, let's face it, the Russian Orthodox Church for centuries has done nothing better than take its cues from the Kremlin. We'll see. Mariologically, there's probably going to continue to be some debate about whether this act actually fulfills the request of the Virgin because the Pope is consecrating not just Russia but Ukraine. You may remember that when Paul VI consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in 1964, when John Paul II did so in 1984, both popes stating that they were acting in accord with the Fatima request. Hardcore Fatima devotee said, nope, not good enough, because it doesn't specifically mention Russia, and not all the bishops are participating. Now, in this case, it does specifically mention Russia, though, admittedly, not just Russia, and all the bishops have at least been invited to participate. They haven't been ordered to do so. Some probably won't, and that will leave some room for criticism as well. But I think it is fair to say this is the most comprehensive stab by a pope to date of acting in accord with Mary's request, even though 
the Vatican claims, and the last surviving Fatima Seer, Sister Lucia, confirmed in 1984 that John Paul's act actually fulfilled the Fatima prophecy. We'll see how they react this time. Bear in mind, many of these people are not huge Pope Francis fans, so there's not much of a benefit of the doubt in this case. Finally, what does this tell us about Francis himself? Well, what I think it shows is that for all the ways in which Pope Francis profiles as a maverick, an innovator, even a revolutionary, he is, in other ways, surprisingly traditional. I mean, think about his approach to governance. He governs like an old-school Jesuit superior. Yeah, there's a system, and he will consult it if he wants to, but he consults anybody he feels like, keeps his cards very close to the chest, and then when he's ready, he makes his own decision. There's no vote, no yes or no, no, you know, approval process. He just decides and then definitely expects everybody else to fall into line. What is that if not traditional Jesuit leadership? But it's probably with the Virgin Mary that his traditionalism is the most clear. As you know, he begins and ends every overseas trip with a visit to Rome's Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, very close to where we are right now, to pray before the icon of Maria Salus Popoli Romani. He has visited every Marian shrine practically in Latin America and Africa by now, at least the major ones, visited Fatima in 2017, invokes Mary's maternal help all of the time, he is classically Latin American popular devotion in that sense. Now, granted, this is not the traditionalism we're used to, okay? This is not crimson and ermine, smells and bells, mass in Latin. That's not his style of traditionalism. But just as there's more than one way to skin a cat, there's more than one way to be a traditionalist, and Francis is definitely rocking his version. All right, moving on. Shaking things up. The Pope published on Saturday with no fanfare or announced warning or explanation or commentary or anything, by the way, his new constitution for the Roman Curia, that's the governing bureaucracy of the Vatican, called Preaching the Gospel. And the idea basically behind it is to try to convert the Roman Curia into an agent of mission and evangelization. What are the big changes? Well, the Pope has opened leadership of Vatican departments to all baptized persons in the church, which of course includes laity, which of course includes women. Um, I mean, to get down into the weeds a minute, he has settled a long-running debate as to whether to exercise vicarious authority in the name of the Pope required being in holy orders. The question has never really been definitively resolved, but heretofore the working answer was, yeah, it does. However, he has specifically stated in this apostolic constitution that that is not the case. Any baptized person can exercise vicarious authority. And so this sets the precedent for naming a layperson to head basically any Vatican department a pope might like, although he did specify that it has to be related to their competence and experience. It may be, for instance, that you know, I mean, in practical terms, the new dicastery for the faith is likely to be head headed by a theologian with pastoral experience, and that probably means a cleric, though not necessarily. We will see. Anyway, big blow for the laity. All right, footnote to this, by the way. The Pope has opened the door, sure, <laughs> but he has not addressed what the other problem is with getting qualified laity, especially at senior positions, to work in the Vatican, which is cash. Are you going to be willing to pay them what they're worth? I mean, you may remember when Cardinal George Pell came over to run the new Secretariat for the Economy, he brought his CFO from Sydney, Danny Casey, veteran, experienced, top-level Aussie businessman, and paid him 400,000 euro, which was a scandal in the Vatican, and ultimately they decided it was unsustainable. Do bear in mind, that was a significant pay cut relative to what Casey can command at home in Australia. Laity are notoriously underpaid and overworked in the Vatican. Remember, the, in a tremendous act of paternal generosity, Pope Francis recently 
expanded the paternal leave allowance for new fathers in the Vatican from one to three days. Okay, just to tell you what the climate is like. Are they going to be willing to put their money where their mouth is and pay cash on the barrel head to get the kind of high profile, high octane, uber qualified laity that some of these gigs actually need? We will see. A second point of interest from the new constitution, it was in a sense a great act of leveling in that the, the old distinction between congregations and councils and so on is now gone. Everything is at a castery, except for what? And that is the Secretary of State, which has long been the 800 pound gorilla of the Vatican scene, but we're now gonna have to call it the 1600 pound gorilla because it is the only non-dicastery left standing and the constitution specifically says basically it's in charge of everybody else. I mean, it uses the word coordinating, but we all know that to coordinate is to control. And, and this is a bit of a surprise because the reform started with the sense that the Secretary of State had to be deconstructed because too much power had been concentrated there. It had become corrupt and the, the system was kind of paralyzed because everybody was waiting for the Secretary of State to decide. But now we end up with the Secretary of State more powerful and more all alone at the top of the mountain than ever before. Good thing, bad thing, I don't know, but it is ironic. Finally, on the sex abuse front, this new constitution folds the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors, which heretofore had been its own kind of anonymous, autonomous entity reporting directly to the Pope, folds it directly into the new dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, which is where the disciplinary response to the abuse crisis has always been located. At one level, it just makes sense, and it also strengthens the Pontifical Commission by making it clear that it is permanent and that it has a home in the Roman Curie. It's not this free-floating anomaly that could just be lifted out and never see the light of day again. It is now sort of set in stone. On the other hand, critics of this see the, this as the Pontifical Commission losing its independence. Famed Irish abuse survivor Marie Collins tweeted out a message to that effect over the weekend saying, that the independence of this commission was, in a sense, always a sham, but now any last semblance of it is gone. We will see how things play out in practice. It is being a spun as a boost to the Vatican's anti-abuse efforts. We'll have to see whether reality matches that rhetoric. Lastly, the Cardinal gets his day in court. Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu formerly the sostituto here in the Vatican, the number two guy in the Secretary of State, which basically made him the Pope's chief of staff, think Leo to Bartlett in the West Wing, who is now on trial for alleged financial crimes and who has been much in the media these past all, year and a half, really, since all this began, finally took the stand this past Thursday all he did, really, was deliver an opening statement and then take a couple questions from the judge. In his opening statement, Beichu certainly came out swinging. He called the charges against him. I'm probably going to forget one of the adjectives here, but grotesque, monstrous, awful, well, you get the idea. He doesn't like them and continued to vigorously deny them all. Also said he has been the victim of a media massacre and what's his reputation back, basically. In the Q&A that followed, presiding judge Giuseppe Pignantone asked Beichu about one of the charges against him, which is that while he was running the Secretary of State, about $150,000 were transferred from the Vatican to a charity run by his brother on his home island of Sardinia. This was seen as nepotism. Bechu basically said he didn't know anything about that loan. It was all routine and handled at lower levels until it was reported in the press. The judge also asked him about his relationship with Cecilia Marogna, who is known here in Rome as the Cardinal's Lady, 
he she was a kind of advisor and counselor to Beichu and to other departments of the Vatican, claims to be a kind of humanitarian spy running secret missions on behalf of the church in the third world. Beichu declined to answer on the grounds of pontifical secrecy. Pignatoni said he's going to ask the Secretary of State if that can be lifted so that Beichu can take those questions. As always, we'll be on top of the trial as it goes forward. We end this week with my announcement of last week in the churches, first ever, and maybe last ever, I don't know, we have to see, first ever Bishop of the Week. I refer to Bishop Alfred Schlert in the Diocese of Allentown, Pennsylvania. Now, if you watch this show on a regular basis, you will know that I've been talking about this Cooks with Collars competition that they had in Allentown, where basically they got about 30 priests to make a video of them making their favorite dishes. And then people voted for their favorite. And by voting, they were making contributions to their parish or to Catholic charities. One of these dishes was so popular, the parish was actually able to replace the boiler in its basement on the strength of the number of votes the, 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 the chef priest was able to garner. Now, along the way, one of these priests was shown wearing an apron that said, many people have eaten in this kitchen and gone on to live healthy, normal lives. I was just utterly charmed and said so on air. In response, Father Phil Hamill of the Diocese of Pro Provincetown of Massachusetts shipped me such an apron earning my undying gratitude. Now, I thought that was the end of it. A few days later, another package shows up in the mail, and I open it, and it's another apron. Not the one I had mentioned on air, in fact, but it was the official cooking with collars apron. Great apron, pockets, and place to put your little pen knife and so on. With a note from Bif Bishop Alfred Schlert of Allentown saying, Sorry I can get you the apron you wanted, but here's the official Cooks with Collars brand apron. I hope you have it, and if you're ever in Rome, I will take you up on your offer of Amatur Chanup. So Bishop Schlert, first of all, thank you for watching. If you do, probably somebody just told you about it. But, but in any event, thank you for such a kind gesture. Please do, the next time you're in Rome, Elise and I have a date. We are having you to our house. I will make Amitrachana, and we will expose you to what I regard as the largest and most sophisticated private collection of Amato anywhere in the city of Rome. Good time will be had by all, I promise. All right, that is the show for this week. You can find full coverage of all of these news items as ever on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com. We are on the brink of putting out a special fundraising appeal, by the way, for support of this show. I love doing it. We love making it. There are apparently people who love watching it, as strange as that seems. But the thing of it is, not only is it a big bite of our, out of our time every week, but it costs money. We have a studio here in Rome that has to be paid for. Our IT folks have to do production on the back end. We get billed for that. And as with everybody right now, times are tough and money is tight. If we're going to continue making this show, we need to crowdfund it. And that's where you come in. So when you get those appeals or if you see them on our site, please respond as generously as you can. It will make a world of difference and ensure that we can keep bringing this little ray of sunshine to you every Tuesday. All right, for the next week, my charge to you is this. Stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.